thank you so much for having invited me to speak here. Both the foundations have been welcoming, and I'm very pleased to be here. And I thank you, and uh, it's wonderful to be here with Pilar and others whom I know. Thank you. So my talk was to do with um, uh, intravenous therapy. And um, actually, I wanted to start by saying what the purposes of IV nutrients are. And this will, of course, cover a lot of the things that have been mentioned in the last two talks. So uh, the purposes have to be known for a person before you uh, embark on IV th therapy. And so the purposes are to provide the cofactors for enzyme functions, all the enzymes that Dr. Pilar was referring to, and to assist with detoxification uh, when there are genetic impediments and also uh, for detoxification per se, and to assist with the removal of pollutants, to encourage the chelation of heavy metals, and to provide nutritional support for those who are undernourished or who are m malnourished. So these are only some of the um, uh, indications. But I know that we've had the most expert talks, the last two talks. But for a clinician, it's quite useful to have a simple thought about uh, what we are using when we um, uh, are metabolizing. We're use, using oxygen uh, to transform nutrients for energy and to oxidize endogenous compounds and to detoxify xeno xenobiotics. But too much oxygen can be a problem um, because we can form free radicals. And we transform stable oxygen to uh, O2 to stable reduced states such as carbon dioxide and hydrogen uh, and water. Um, and we, there are four el electrons added to each oxygen molecule. Uh, in the reduction of oxygen, this can be incomplete, making unstable species, which are called oxygen-derived oxygen free radicals, superoxide and hydroxyl radicals. This is very simple stuff compared with what we've been hearing. But nevertheless, it's, it's useful because uh, oxygen is uh, the, the, one of the principles we're going to be talking about again tomorrow. But it, of course, as you know, is necessary for the utilization of food. Then we produce um, uh, superoxide, uh, peroxide, um, hydroxyl and hydroxide <coughs> radicals. The defense mechanisms um, are things which will quench these um, oxygen-derived free radicals and include these nutrients. So we need to, to know uh, that we're providing these nutrients for people. Um, vitamin A, beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E, glutathione, cysteine. And of course, we've been, had a superb exposition about all the enzymes, but we need catalase, superoxide dismutase, and glutathione peroxidase. We can't always provide these. Uh, we cannot necessarily provide the enzymes, though we can actually provide superoxide dismutase. Sorry, we can actually provide the superoxide dismutase. It's said to be very unstable if taken by mouth. But nevertheless, we use it that way anyway. But I've used it intravenously in saving people who, who'd been um, uh, heavily tr um, exposed to pesticides. Um, but so oxygen radical formation is increased uh, in hyperoxia, um, tissue ischemia. Excess formation will oxida actually oxidize tissues. We have to be aware that uh, although all those enzymes were so cl clearly elucidated for us, the oxidation of tissues results in quite a lot of, of damage to the tissues because we can get unsaturated fatty acids in cell membranes, uh, DNA, hyaluronic acid, and proteins, which uh, if they are oxidized, are irre irreversibly altered. And once 
initiated peroxidation of lipids within cell membranes tends to be self-perpetuating. And Dr. Uh, Marty Paul attests to this because he's talked about peroxidation and it being uh, an upregulating part of the no no cycle. Um, um, so proteins, of course, the amino acids, cysteine, methionine, tyrosine, phenylalanine, tri tryptophan, um, in proteins, if these are, if the proteins are oxidized, they can be irre irrevocably altered. Some enzymes contain transitional metals which are oxidized by these uh, ODFR, and uh, others, they can react with various components of DNA to produce strand breakages and other alterations of genetic material. Cell death or abnormal cell growth, such as malignancy, and cellular changes in lipids, protein, and DNA, which uh, have clinical manifestations of oxygen radical mediated disease. Now, what we know with our patients is that we can measure some things, and some things we ca cannot, but we certainly can measure sometimes the um, cellular changes in DNA. We find DNA adducts, and so that's one of the things we look for when we're seeing what needs to be done for helping patients to clear products from them. So um, I mentioned hyperoxia tissue ischemia, inflammation, drugs and toxins can all alter the proteins. And transitional met metals are also a problem. They readily pass between the oxidized and reduced states and they accept and transfer electrons as they do. In particular, they're, they're a problem in the condition called hemochromatosis, uh, which is uh, where there is extra iron which collects in the tissues, and it'll collect in um, uh, all the joints, give people, um, and, and in, in tissues like the liver and the pancreas, um, and uh, also in synovial fluid in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So just to consider neoplasia and radiation, benzapyrene and the aromatic amine carcinogens, which are, uh, can be formed into radicals through cytochrome metabolism. Um, uh, they, the chemical bonds to DNA and other critical intracellular molecules can occur and benzapyrene undergoes redox cycling, which will provide the oxygen-derived free radicals, which can attack DNA. So in antineoplastic agents will undergo redox cycling in, in malignant tissue, producing these oxygen-derived free radicals. These ones, doxyrubicin, bleomycin, mycin C. We have to be aware that they can be very dangerous too. Um, and radiation uh, is another source of uh, ODFR. It acts on tissues through direct reduction of the, of the uh, oxygen. Lethal doses of radiation uh, sufficient to kill the a cell will occur when, when you're irradiating a neoplasm, but small doses can produce sublethal damage, including modification of DNA. And this, will, this is a particular risk for people who are flying a lot, or pilots, crews, you know, a big group of occupational hazards. Now, I just mentioned, of course, we've had a, 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 all the account from uh, Dr. Pilar of um, uh, the complex enzymes that we're using. But in, in a clinical situation, I mentioned that we have to be aware of a few things in particular. Gilbert syndrome, Gilbert syndrome, uh, is, occurs in between in 5 to 7 percent of the population. So it's something that's very common, and it's something we see all the time. Uh, our patients then will have uh, a problem in um, glucuronidation, and particularly of endogenous substance, endogenous bilirubin, which results in its accumulation and jaundice. And this is paralleled by a deficiency 
of glucuronidation of other compounds, which has quite a lot of toxicological um, implications. Um, because there are a lot of products that go down the glucuronidation pathway, as we've been um, told. Um, it's responsible for breaking down, um, um, sorry, catechols, estrogens, bile acids, lots of things, lots of drugs. And there are also items which will induce these, like clofibrate and phenobarbitone and so on. So when there's an impediment in glucuronidation, then there's an extra call on glutathione conjugation for some substances. So we've been through phase one and phase two with our excellent presentation. However, the measurement in a clinical situation is by challenging people with different chemicals and measuring their products. So to do this is a very simple way of evaluating phase one and phase two. We do caffeine clearance to evaluate phase one and um, uh, paracetamol uh, clearance or aspirin clearance to measure the glutathione conjugation, glycine conjugation, sulfation. Uh, and you'll see here for sulfation, um, the recovery uh, of percentage of sulfates can be achieved and the recovery of the percentage of glucuronide can be perceived. So we've done this for hundreds of patients now, and we find that we can evaluate um, what the uh, problem is with these patients. We found that there is very poor sulfoxidation um, in patients, and this leads then to poor availability of sulfation for this process. So um, the glucuronidation then takes over. So I won't mention this too much except because it's all been gone through by my uh, predecessor except to say that um, if people have fast phase one, they will age far quickly. And they'll, uh, in uh, excess of these will age people, particularly smokers, they'll prematurely wrinkle. It's uh, phase one, it's required for reducing toxins. Um, the treatment, if you've got poor phase one function, is beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E. Phase one, if it's slow, it will be decreased clearance of toxins, and you need to support the detox program and profiles of the individual. And phase two, if it's fast, there's excessive induction of enzymes possibly by a toxic load. Uh, you have to reduce the toxins, take antioxidants. Phase two, if it's slow, there's an inadequate liver function, and you have to use things to import, Im improve liver function. Now, uh, so detoxification, different combinations require different therapies. And this is why we need to know this, because 43% of our patients have poor sulfoxidation, which is a huge percentage, which means that we have to provide them with sulfate. And um, almost uh, uh, a quarter of them have almost nil sulfoxidation. So um, the objectives of biodetoxification are fat mobilization and uh, enhancement of the body's natural detox uh, path pathways. So uh, in a depuration program, we would mobilize fat, increase sweat and sebum, prevent gastrointestinal reabsorption of xenobiotics by using something like cholestyramine, and improve the provision of nutrients. So we do these things in deep depuration, exercise, thermal chamber showers, massage, and nutrients. I've shown this at a previous meeting here, but just to emphasize that we do need to, in a clinical setting, be aware of the effects of pollutants. Now, we, we can know that a general body burden of pollutants can do a certain number of things, and we've had a lot of this uh, description from Bill and so on, but 
actually the protective nutrients, oops, I beg your pardon, let me go back. <laughs> um, uh, the protective nutrients uh, are these here, calcium, iron, zinc, vitamin C, amino acids, and you can use nutritional therapies with garlic and eggs and beans and high sulfur amino acids. Um, but, and for mercury, again, we need to know the things that can be used, selenium, vitamin C, sulfur amino acids, nutritional therapies, ascorbic acids, and so on. Um, and this is not really legible, but it's just to emphasize that it's possible to identify the physiological systems which are affected by all these um, chlorinated pesticides down here, and also um, for or organophosphate pesticides, this is rather a short list, but um, uh, also for um, solvents, we know, can identify the systems affected. So it's going to be important to measure these before we do any detox and use the IVs. So we measure by looking for pollutants. We do fat biopsies. We do the tests to e evaluate pollutants. Um, we do blood tests to check out the levels of the detoxifying substances that we're going to need. And then we embark on programs of treatment. Um, so we assess with urine sulfide, organic acids, polypeptides. We would do various things like these here on the right, the um, bacterial overgrowth, look at fecal toxic elements or hair elements, amino acids, um, to look at the organophosphate metabolites either in the urine or the blood, and look for things so that we can then uh, um, use our knowledge to help the individual. So the indications, of course, for IV therapy, which is symbolized there, is chemical sensitivity, the presence of lipophilic xenobiotics in blood or fat biopsies, history of exposure to lipophilic uh, uh, xenobiotics or heavy metal intoxication, or the presence of ex excess heavy metal residues in the tissues. Now, the original intravenous therapies were of Myers cocktails. And these, this was by John Myers, who's a physician in Baltimore in Maryland, who pioneered the use of intravenous IV uh, vitamins and minerals. He died in 1984. And his theory was that by bypassing the digestive system through the intravenous administration of micronutrients, you could get the blood levels of these substances greatly increased. And in this way, the nutrients would be pressed into the cells. And uh, his cocktail was of magnesium chloride, gluconate, uh, calcium gluconate, hydroxycobalamin, pyridoxin B6, dexpanthenol B5, B complex, and vitamin C. However, uh, we use this at Breakspear. We use uh, vitamin C, and we can use different doses of vitamin C. We've used up to 50 grams in a day, but B complex, which can, includes all of the other, all of the B vitamins, up to 50 milligrams uh, in, per mil in that, um, and folic acid, 15 milligrams, pyridoxin, 50 milligrams, dexpanthamol, 250. We use magnesium sulfate rather than, than magnesium uh, chloride because of requiring the sulfate. There are, there are a large number of our patients that require the sulfate. We also use zinc. We put in taurine, uh, which is excellent for the heart and for the blood vessels, and thiamine in quite a big dose as well. Now, this is a sort of very standard one that we use, but we can modify the amounts in our cocktails uh, because they're made up of the individual ingredients and therefore we can use uh, four grams of magnesium sulfate. Um, we can use, um, uh, as I say, up to 50 grams of vitamin C, which we do very co commonly in patients in several different infusions. And we aim to keep the correct 
uh, level of nutrients in it so that it's physiologically acceptable. So we would use half normal saline or, or normal saline depending on what we would be uh, using. So intravenous admi administration of nutrients can as achieve serum concentrations which are not all obtainable with oral or intramuscular administration. And I think that this is really important because we are getting the very handicapped, the people who are extremely ill, and what we have to do is to use very large quantities of vitamin C sometimes. Um, the, when the daily intake of vitamin C is incre increased 12-fold from 200 to 2.5 milligrams a day, the plasma concentration increases by only 25%. Um, that's if you're taking it by mouth. But we can get far more in when we're doing it uh, IV. The antiviral effect of vitamin C has been demonstrated as a concentration of 10 to 15 milligrams uh, per DL at a level of achievable with IV but not oral therapy. This is an essential treatment. High dose vitamin C is an essential treatment when you're treating people who have got chronic viral infections. And we use it sequentially, day after day, for 10 days, or even a month for people. And it's extremely valuable. Um, so at a concentration of 88 milligrams in vivo, vitamin C destroyed 72% of the histamine present in the medium. So we can use it for people who have got hyperhistamine states, people who have got m mast cells exploding in the body. So it's extremely important as a nutrient support for our people who are very sick. Magnesium ions promote relaxation of vascular and bronchial smooth muscle. It's, there's literature showing that it's useful in, in asthma and uh, angina. Um, the a average magnesium concentration in myocardial cells is 10 times higher than the extracellular concentration. 10 times higher. So we have patients whom we've looked at. Now, we've done about 500 studies on the autonomic nervous system, and we find that these people have inotropic failure. This means that the contractility of the heart is poor. This is in practically all our patients with chronic fatigue. So what do we do? We give them magnesium. That's the number one thing to give them. And uh, we have to do this to get more magnesium into uh, the heart. And you see here an example. Oh, sorry. Uh, the mean myocardial magnesium concentration, 65% lower in patients with cardiomyopathy than in healthy controls. So this is because we know that our patients with fatigue states have inotropic fatigue, which is heart fatigue. It's present in practically everyone with chronic fatigue, with MCS, with food sensitivities. And we know that the intracellular to the ex extracellular ratio is less good than it should be. We have to use IV magnesium sulfate. So here we are. Um, so this increases the serum concentrations, and it's a window of opportunity for ailing cells to take up magnesium against a smaller concentration gradient. You can't give too much magnesium by mouth. People have diarrhea. So this is the way to do it. You can use magnesium sulfate in the bath for children, and they absorb a certain amount. And this is pioneered by the work of Rosemary Waring and ourselves, because we did all the work with Rosemary, which showed that they were self-oxidation deficits. So um, de dependence on IV <coughs> injections could conceivably result from any, I shouldn't say all the work, I beg your pardon. We didn't do all the work. We did a great chunk of it um, from the middle of the 80s until uh, the early 90s. So uh, we know that um, we have to think about genetically determined impairment in the capacity to maintain normal intracellular nutrient concentrations. 
any inborn era of, era of metabolism that can be controlled only by having a higher than normal concentration of a particular nutrients or through a le renal leak of nutrients. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the renal leak of nutrients because they're in, it's incredibly important for treatment of our patients that we correct these deficits. We do cell membrane repair. This is another major thing that we do with IV nutrients. The membrane of every cell and organelle is a lipid bilayer that encases and protects the internal working cellular components. This lipid envelope does far more than protect the cells. It contains thousands of peptides that are the doors and windows of the cell. And these mucopolypeptides provide the array of receptors that convey the essential communication through prostaglandin regulatory activity. And these are uh, the, the wonderful little doors and windows that Pilar talked about. Um, essential fatty acids are the precursors to prostaglandins that control all cell-to-cell -cell communications, and without which there's no complex life. So you have to get an optimum balance of fatty acids of the phospholipids that form this dynamic cell membrane. And this tri lipid bilayer is made up of two layers of lipids with little tails. They look like tadpoles with the tails that go inside towards each other. Um, and it's so minute that, um, it, uh, you know, it would take 10,000 membranes to make up the thickness of this little piece of paper. But we have the key here to how a lot of life evolved. And we have to expel waste from cells and synthesize molecules inside. So we have to create from gene expression the proteins that are needed for, for, for the cellular gates. And uh, the control of these peptides rests with the membranes. So the membrane is incredibly important. If we've got aberrant cell lipid membrane, lip, lipid metabolism, this can follow from exposure to neurotoxins. It can be a biomarker for neuroinflammation or um, uh, immunoinflammation, as, <laughs> as Danny was ex explaining. But for, caused by bacteria, viruses, chemicals, moles, heavy metals, and patients with MS or Alzheimer's or autism or Parkinson's, so on. So the repair of lipids is very important. And we use this targeted approach with phosphatidylcholine, a correct balance of omega-6 and 3, folinic acid, glutathione, and butyrate to clear the neurotoxins and to help people. And we also use methylation support with MB12, riboflavin, uh, and NADH is also required. So um, this mitochondrial dysfunction that we see in our patients is what links diseases ranging from Parkinson's to diabetes and uh, people who have organ failure and sepsis or exercise intolerance and muscle fatigue. And some of this uh, has been collated by my colleague, Dr. Yo, Christabel Yo, who works with us, um, who's um, been, who has uh, compiled a lot of information. There are more than 200 known pathogenic mutations in mitochondrial DNA, and more than 2,000 in nuclear DNA, and we look for them, and we find them. We've got a very uh, helpful biochemist who's able to find them for us. So toxins, uh, just to go through this quickly because I've not got much time. Um, uh, we, we know about the toxins. We've been through those. This is the translocator structure uh, where we have ADP and ATP um, shifting between the two sides. And we do translocator studies and find out what's happening about intracellular calcium and those things which are magnesium dependent. Blockage of the translocators can cause delay in ATP to ATP, 
uh, ADP to ATP. So um, vitamin C then, I'm going to go this quite, quite, quite fast, but you're welcome to these slides. Uh, vitamin C cannot be absorbed in big doses. So we, we have to make it. We don't make it ourselves. We have to have it provided. Um, and the requirement as an antioxidant increases if there's a phase two problem. Um, oral vitamin C produces plasma concentrations that are tightly controlled, and only IV vitamin C produces high plasma and urine concentrations that can have anti-tumor activity. And we measure, and we measure whether or not tumors can be killed off by uh, doing a, a test which, um, in which we grow the tumor cells and the tumor cells are then exposed to 100 different items, and we'll see which one can kill off the tumor cell. And vitamin C is one of the number ones. So B12, uh, it's needed for two major reactions, methyl malonase coase mutase, uh, which is required for a lot of different actions. But in fact, it's also a peroxynitrite scavenger, as um, Marty Paul will tell us. Um, thiamine B1, carbohydrate metabolism, branch chain amino acid metabolism, and therefore we use the very high doses intravenously, 100 milligrams, and by benfotium and the fat soluble one we give to people who, who require it for mental performance. Riboflavin B2, um, these are the functions of it, um, and Again, it's put into our Myers, so-called Myers cocktail. But you'll see it's important for uh, lipid metabolism, monoamine oxidase, breakdown of new, neuro, certain neurotransmitters, xanthine oxidase, um, and in fact, all those people taking caffeine will need extra riboflavin. So. Um, Niacin B3, all the essential functions. We, we, I simply mentioned these, they're in, in the textbooks, but the point is that we're explaining why we need these intravenously, because often we cannot get the right uh, proportions for helping our patients. Um, and uh, pantothenic acid, we put it in there, it's a component of coenzyme A, is needed at the beginning of the Krebs cycle, uh, fatty acid synthesis. Um, um, it's needed, it's, it's um, the functions of coenzyme A, it's, it's lipid-related phospholipid synthesis, protein-related, carbohydrate-related. So panthenic acid is a very important, fortunately it's ubiquitous, but nevertheless we use it because we need it. And especially in anybody with malabsorption, it was the first paper I published. <laughs> anyway, vitamin B6, um, uh, pyridoxin, uh, you'll see all the different functions of it here for heme synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, carbohydrate, amino acid, lipid metabolism. It's, uh, it's provided, therefore, in our cocktails Folate. Now, there are two forms, folic acid and folinic acid, um, and we are veering towards using more, more folinic acid now, though we do use folic acid as well when, in high doses when we're trying to get rid of viruses. But then we go over to folinic acid uh, for the brain, and folinic acid is the one that should actually be used in pregnancy rather than folic acid. Um, magnesium, we've meant, touched on, um, it's required for over 300 enzyme systems and it's required for energy production, uh, synthesis of essential molecules, it helps to transport ions, participates in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. And zinc, zinc citrate, and so on. I'm coming on very quickly to glutathione, we've, we've been through that, it's requirement a lot, it's antioxidant properties and scavenging free radicals. It's very important uh, in, in our patients, and it's uh, metabolism for conversion of formaldehyde to formate, 
that's one of the common uh, chemicals Bill tells us we need to get rid of. And it regulates intracellular redox status. It's needed for gene expression, signal transduction, cytokine production. Um, now, just in the last few minutes, I've got two or three minutes. <laughs> it's lit. Yes? Okay. Intralipid. Uh, intralipid we use in toxicity. It will act as a sump. It absorbs the pollutants that are in the body. You can, uh, if it's going through quite fast, it's our experience, Danny's experience in particular, that it will uh, clear pollutants from the body. And so we use that. We don't just use the phospho phosphatidylcholine uh, and so on, but intralipid will bind things, and there is evidence for this in the literature. Uh, it's used for patients who are unable to obtain sufficient nutrition as well, but it is composed of soya bean oil, uh, egg phospholipids, and glycerine, so you have to de neutralize people for it sometimes. And they put in some uh, vitamins as well, fat-soluble vitamins in it, and we do IV chelation as well. So in conclusion, intravenous therapy is an essential tool in environmental medicine. Thank you. Thank you.